All right, let's get started. I'm just going to turn on our backup recording. Recording in progress. All right. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Brain Club. Um, I will just introduce myself to begin. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong. And this is Brain Club. And before we get started, I just want to, um, I know that there's many people joining from um, outside of Vermont today. Um, and for those who are inside of Vermont and are impacted by um, this terrible flood, I just want to sort of acknowledge, acknowledge the heaviness of all of this and for, for the stress that so many people are under and for all, all, that, all that many people have lost. Um, so I, uh, I just wanted to, to name that before, before anything. Hold on, I'm having, I'm having uh, technical difficulties. Mostly related to user error, fixed. Okay, great. All right. Um, oh, thank, um, uh, and th thank you. Lizzie's posting in the chat for those who are local and need some resources. Vermont Public has put together some resources around emergency housing um, and uh, locally in Montpelier. Um, another way is gathering uh, food and clothing um, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to share some other links as we, as we go through. All right, I'm gonna share screen. All right, so tonight uh, we'll be discussing neurodivergent employment and health. This is Brain Club, our very, um, our, for the past year and a half, this is our education space for the collective All Brains Belong community for the purpose of educating the community around neurodiversity and everyday li brain life topics. Just because uh, many of you have um, many different types of relationships with us, we like to just like name name the, uh, the 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 context of Brain Club. This is an educational space. It's not a support group, and we're not able to give medical or mental health advice in this context. Um, uh, because uh, and, and and just to name the thing of that um, when 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 people start processing trauma or other kinds of, 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 of issues that without wraparound support and ongoing medical and mental health care, um, uh, it, it, it can be unsafe for that person. So we like to just name the thing, Brain Club is for education. All forms of participation are okay here. Um, many of you have figured out already, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. Um, so uh, we certainly don't expect you to look, look at the camera or anything. So feel free to, you know, walk, move, fidget, stim, eat, take breaks, um, I, what, what, uh, do, do, what, do whatever needs doing. Um, and everyone is welcome here at Brain Club and all formats of communication are welcome. So you can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. Um, uh, we will likely have a smaller group tonight, um, probably be, uh, due to the circumstances. Um, so um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, the selectivity of reading out the chat um, may, not, may not be so relevant as it is when it's a bigger group. Um, the other piece of ground rule that I'll name is just that we affirm all aspects of identity and that we respect and protect the group's collective access needs, what the group needs for full and meaningful participation. And safety is the most important thing to us. So if there's anything that makes you feel uncomfortable for any reason during Brain Club, um, Lizzie Parat, our education programs coordinator. Lizzie, can you wave? If you're able to wave, it's totally fine if you're not. Amazing. Okay, so that's Lizzie. Um, so you can send a private message to Lizzie who will be able to respond a lot, a lot more quickly than I will, especially if I'm in shared screen mode and not looking at the chat. Um, all right, so um, last bit of ground rules, um, just giving, just respect and give space for all participants. Yeah, okay. Can you see it? And, um, and um, last bit of access needs. So uh, closed captioning is enabled. You just need to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on what version of Zoom you have, either using the live transcript closed captioning icon, but if you don't see that one, look for the more dot 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 
and choose show subtitles. You can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you'd like to turn them off. And um, if you're new to Zoom um, or just by way of refreshing, the chat box um, uh, tonight tonight will be a community panel, community members sharing their their lived experiences related to employment. Um, it's a it's a pre-recorded um, uh, panel, so we'll have the chat box going during um, the the panel portion, and we'll have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. Um, so that it, that speech bubble icon, that's the chat box. Okay. So oops. tonight we're kicking off our new monthly theme around reimagining community. Um, and we'll be looking at various aspects of community inclusion. Um, tonight we'll be talking about employment and the um, intersectional variables that, um, that, 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 that come from um, issues around employment. Um, next week, we'll have a special guest, um, one of the co-authors of um, one of my favorite books, Parenting for Social Justice. Chrissy Colon Bratt will be here. Um, and then our book chat for July is We're Not Broken by Eric Garcia. All right, we will start. So um, what I would say is that, um, for the, especially for those who have not been to Brain Club before and are maybe, maybe All Brains Belong is, is new to you too. Um, so we're an organization that is trying to make life better for neurodivergent people across the lifespan. And it was very clear to us when we launched a year and a half ago that to do anything for the neurodivergent community, we have to do everything because it would be, it would have been, you know, okay to open a medical practice. That's one of the things that we do, um, but we have to change the world. So um, uh, in addition to educating the broader community around neuroinclusivity, um, we have employment support programs um, and we help people access their education, we help people make friends. So because these are all part of health. And when we think about employment, there are a lot of people who do not have their access needs met by the defaults of society. Um, you know, the defaults of healthcare, you must pick up the phone to become a new patient, um, the defaults of the education system, you know, you must sit in the chair, you must sit still for eight hours. Um, the defaults of workplaces, there are lots of defaults at a lot of different workplaces, right? So, so when we think about access, um, anything that someone needs for full participation, um, there are a lot of different types of access needs, and so therefore a lot of opportunities to be thwarted. Um, and what happens often is that the person doesn't recognize that it's their access needs being thwarted. Um, they internalize that there's something wrong or broken about themselves a lot of the time. So one of the things that we do often at Brain Club is try to like, unlearn that and break that down. And so when we think about neurodivergence and employment, the consequences of large numbers of neurodivergent people not having their access needs met in the workplace is that autistic adults are two and a half to eight times more likely to be unemployed or underemployed. Um, and 75% at least of ADHDers experience employment related challenges as well. What we know is that, um, you know, and this, we're always thinking about health as a community health organization, um, employment and health are inextricably linked. Unemployment increases the probability of developing a chronic health condition by 83%. Um, and employment at any level um, has a huge impact on reducing mental distress. And we could think about all of the reasons for that. Um, the financial aspects of that, the psychological impact of that. And when we think about inclusion, um, we talk a lot here about all of the ways in which humans are marginalized and othered and how, um, especially if you have many aspects of your identity that are marginalized and othered, um, there's that intersectional impact of that marginalization. And so when we think about the intersectional experiences of being marginalized in employment, um, this becomes even more problematic. Um, we, we, we looked at this graphic at, at, uh, at our last Brain Club, looking at um, 
and this comes from the, Depart uh, the Vermont Department of Health, um, looking at like how all of these things connect to health, all of the social inequities, which you know interrelate with the institutional inequities, which of course impact people's living conditions. I'm just gonna zoom in and make it make it bigger. There we go. Um, so there's just all of these things which impact health. And then when you also throw in, um, so here we are, you know, we're going to be, um, when, when, when we, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to, to class in a second, but when we think about these social inequities, which are going to um, have a huge impact on um, like the, 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 the systemic barriers to all of these things that connect to health. And then we also thwart people's ability to access healthcare. Um, we see a lot of problems. What we don't want is we don't want the square peg being hammered to fit into the round hole. And that is what happens so often um, for all kinds of people. Um, in the book, Parenting for Social Justice, and this is the book I referenced earlier, we have one of the co-authors is coming to present at Brain Club next week. Um, Class is described as a relative social hierarchical ranking. Um, another way of looking at that might be, um, might be similar roles in the economic system. It might be cultural knowledge, skills, networks, and all of these variables with all the other ways in which people are, are marginalized plays out. Um, and so, you know, in thinking about in this as a combination of access to resources, your relationship to work, um, all of these many reasons that impact how much you feel like you belong and whether you have power. And there's so many power imbalances in any given situation. I'm going to quote from Parenting for Social Justice. So um, uh, Jamie Lynn Castle describes um, what, what economic oppression has, has felt like for her. Um, we were drowning in a river of stress, trying to swim through it and mostly failing. The shame and guilt that I carried with me over how society viewed me simply because of my circumstances was extremely heavy. When I've been completely stressed out worrying financially, my brain just couldn't work efficiently. It took so much energy just to exist. And so with that, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna introduce our community panel. Um, it was really important to us here to have many different fields of employment, many different types of jobs represented in this community panel. Um, so we have, um, um, uh, someone who works in food service, construction, law, social services, childcare, um, and all the many different types of employment status represented. And so, anyway, um, I, I, I all this 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 background context just for like a lens to 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 be thinking through as we watch this panel. I am going to stop share. I'm going to actually look at the chat. Um, and I am going to open up our video. I'm uh, one of the ways I, uh, that, that, that I support my motor planning differences is talking through all of the sequencing steps. So don't mind me. Okay, here we go. Did I click the sound? I don't remember. So I'm going to do it again. I did. All right. Here we go. What have you seen in your workplace or in workplaces that you've worked in um, about how working conditions impact health? I work food service jobs. I'm a baker. So I've all of my jobs have been in kitchens. The things that I've found that impact health conditions the most are the practices in food service around um, scheduling. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase in school, 
um, the bell doesn't release you, I release you. <laughs> in, in, you know, early education, before the pandemic hit, people were struggling. Um, it was a field that was already really kind of um, hemorrhaging people. It was really suffering. Here we were open 10 and a half hours every day for children. And so teachers were required to be here on either end of that too. So like for an administrator, I, I would be here for at least 12 hours a day. Um, but so we had, we kind of walked into that scenario and then worked to even just maintain it, you know, just to keep it going, keep the machine going. A mentality where it's like, I know it said nine on your sheet, but you're here until it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, and because food service tends to pay less than a lot of fields, um, it can be very, very dangerous to try and set boundaries in situations like that. So because we need it, I mean, these are human lives that we're taking care of. So we need to be here. We need people covering. Um, we need the proper legal ratios of adult to child. So we could, we were less flexible with people's schedules, longer hours. We had more kids. We really kind of, when we came in, we filled the rooms because that's like the business model. Of course, like more kids equals more money coming in. So we had more kids in rooms, larger group sizes and fewer teachers. Yeah, I mean, it, it ended up being sort of, we're just doing everything we can to survive. What have you seen in your workplace about how working conditions impact health? I mean, I think it, in terms, it impacts health in terms of stressors. And I think there's like, in, in a lot of ways, there's a ton of them. There's like social stressors, conflict, conflict with coworkers and supervisors. There's performance stressors, understanding tasks and executing them. There's productivity stress. Um, can I meet the output and production expectations in the time that's allotted with the with energy that I can sustainably access? Um, there's logistical stressors. I'm working um, during preset hours with a schedule that's often set by somebody else at varying locations for varying durations, varying activities, varying obligations. So if I'm a person that has effect, uh, emotional or um, executive functioning or motor pattern, motor patterning or attention or energy challenges or un unpredictable sleep patterns, all of that can make uh, keeping track of schedules, uh, uh, having the energy to follow schedules, uh, being able to get to the right place at the right time with the right supplies um, and, and, um, and perform consistently during the hours of obligation. Um, really difficult if my body clock and my energy vary widely, um, along with my ability to plan um, and anticipate needs and concentrate and pay attention. I have a brain that means that I really, really need to know what's going to happen before I go and do something. And it becomes extremely dysregulating for me and for a lot of other people who I've worked with when we can't have like even a ballpark of like how many hours we're going to be working, what that shift is going to look like, how many people are going to be there, whether everyone else is going to show up, because those are all common concerns in the field that I work in. And the uncertainty of that makes me dysregulated to an extent that it's like, okay, I said I could do these things and I could be responsible for these tasks, but you know, I am not fully present anymore. So it's a lot <laughs> less physically safe for me to be, you know, lifting the 50 pound bags of flour or operating the heavy machine, trying to cut this thing super fast because my understanding of my body has gone from like 30% to 0% because it doesn't feel like I can, it doesn't feel my needs don't feel relevant to my safety and my environment anymore. So I am not going to think about whether I'm too warm. I'm not going to think about whether I'm thirsty. I'm not going to think about whether I need to sit down for five minutes and eat something. I'm just going to do it until it's done and I can be done being here. Like supervisory stress. And so how to be a person in and who highly values autonomy like, like a lot of us are, you know, the, the PDA stuff, persistent desire for autonomy. So how do I, how do, do I be in a workplace um, and a person who consistently values autonomy and needs to understand why someone else's way is better in order to really get myself to do it in an environment where 
basically unquestioning or minimally questioning compliance is expected. So um, something that I really struggle with is like, there's social cues, and then there's the social cues of capitalism. And those are like, you can't find out, like once you find out like the motivation behind what someone is telling you, it's like, you have to do the like what is the hardest thing in the world to me and just accept that the answer is just because <laughs> um like i need to know why something is happening why something does something and it's very very hard for me to be like it just is that way and you need to not think about it for a while um and part of that motivation that like drives all business is like not wanting people to know that they have to ask certain questions or have to advocate for themselves in certain ways and certain jobs making it much much more risky to have like try and enter into those negotiations so i've been in situations where i'm being like dramatically underpaid um because i did not know that everyone else around me was getting like the salaries that they were getting from a place of like I've been doing this, that, and the other that is beyond the job description I signed on for. It is time for you to pay me more money because I am doing more labor for you. There's been times in that where, like, you know, it's my turn to talk or relate something or engage in the conversation. And um, I, I want to make a point. I have a point to make. Um, and then I start getting the sense from the facilitator that like, you know, uh, that person, he or she will cut me off or kind of like, you know, I get the sense moving along and which um, I think, because I also suffer from some low self-esteem, I think, which is an outcome of, you know, my oh, ADHD. So then I'm suddenly like in this loop where I'm like, well, you know, maybe what I have to say is not of interest, you know, and it's really just, I think that I, in that kind of environment, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on getting to the point and, and, and letting the rest of the group engage. And I certainly want to, to um, fit into that, Try, trying to, I guess, you know, sort of navigate within that framework that is the framework that is mostly dictated by neurotypical people, right? Right, and so there's there's also this element of, um, you know, the, 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 a neuro-inclusive space would, would involve a facilitator that like lays out ground rules about there's no right way to participate. There's no right way to communicate. And like explicitly naming that, you know, that's not what most groups do. Which kitchens have. Um, but also like, I'm transgender. And part of that was that I recently had, I like, I experience or experienced chest dysphoria. And so for a long time, I was binding my chest and that meant that like not only is it super dysregulating to work in more than eight hour a day but uh doing that <laughs> results in like stabbing rib pains that may or may yeah. not take you after surgery so part of it was like i had to have surgery and that was a medical necessity for me like regardless of how it impacted my mental health um and like accessing other forms of gender affirming health care were really really imperative to me and I, that's not going to be the case for every trans person but like i think that's definitely like a consideration as kitchens tend to attract multiply marginalized people because i've been in a lot of kitchens with other trans folks with other neurodivergent folks where it's like okay so these expectations are built around cis bodies and a one neurotype <laughs> um and my body actually can't <laughs> be here yeah. for 12 hours <laughs> um otherwise i start having heart palpitations yeah. so and then and then you add on top of that the personal life stressors um that that um can come up and any of those things uh, one can have difficulty i can have difficulty managing become dysregulated um the hyper focus means that i tend to get and stay distracted from work those are all stressors and then once i get like any of those stressors you know that that can start to lead that that it goes unresolved can lead to it really gets me into a, a, a vicious cycle of a, a dysregulation spiral so i get i get stressed out 
I get anxious, um, that which leads to mental and physical tension. I go into defensive behaviors, worry, self-protective avoidance, distraction. Um, there's this regulation, including sleep, which leads to less capacity for attention, less capacity for motor skills and motor planning, less executive functioning, which then can lead to more and bigger mistakes, um, hyper-focus, getting stuck on the wrong details, self-justification, externalizing blame, attacking the perceived sources of threat, all of which go over really well in a work environment, leading to more, fit, more negative feedback, possible discipline, job loss, bad reviews that limit my potential to advance and my potential for access to organizational power and privilege that could actually help me fix the problems that are affecting me. And then all of that leads to more dysregulation, less resilience, greater vulnerability to that. Um, the tendency to hyper-focus, which is consistent for a lot of us with ADHD and, and, and autism, and it's a superpower when it comes to focusing on job related tasks, but it's a liability if there's a stressor. Um, because, and that's that's troubling because then it becomes difficult to th think about anything or do anything else until that stressor is resolved. And so un unless there is an ability to resolve um, uh, to resolve issues of concern. The hyper focus tends to um, tends to really get in the way of the the things that um, that employers are looking for. So when my needs aren't met, but me asking to have my needs met is going to be penalized. Remember when I was working uh, at a child care center, my position was as a floater, which meant that I didn't know what was needed of me or expected of me or what my day was going to look like until I was there. And I remember having a big conversation with my boss and being like, OK, this next year around, I can't handle this. And I feel that my my uh, showing up here, my attendance and being a good employee is being impacted when I don't know what's expected of me. We had this big, long talk and then um, she like reformatted it that floaters would be assigned to specific rooms. So you would have at least know where you were going to be, who you were going to be working with and everything. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. And then I remember having, oh, and it like, oh man, it puts a little ache in, in my chest. I remember feeling so like proud of that and everything. And then walking by and hearing someone be like, you mean I have to do the same thing every day? And I was like, oh my gosh, I just ruined that person's life. Like now that person is gonna have to do the same thing every day and it's all my fault. Um, Cause you know, I have a control over all of their feelings. Um. <laughs> so, so a couple of things that are standing out for me listening to this part of your story. Um, one is it's a story of unmet access needs. Access needs being anything that someone needs for full meaningful participation. So you needed novelty, you needed multiple different things in the day, you needed multiple locations, you needed movement, um, mm. you know, you needed a variety, like all of this. And so that was unmet. Another thing I heard from your story was it's a story of interdependence. Like I think independence is so overly glorified. Autonomy is really important, but 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 the idea that like you don't need other people, interdependence, being connected to relying on other people, like like how profoundly human is that and so mm. anyway that's I'm, I'm also that i'm also hearing that from your story and that you know in the team that you're leading now that you are bringing this lens of of whether you're using this term or not you're thinking about access needs and how to help the people that you're leading have met access needs and like you know um I think there's a lot of small businesses that struggle with like hiring good people and keeping people and like all the all the lost revenue of turnover and all the things right when you train a new person um like when people have their access needs they are less likely to quit their jobs for sure yeah right exactly um yeah it's just not a one size fits all not just because it was in childcare, typically at that time, I think like a revolving door staffing wise. I mean, people were really burning out. It was a recipe for burnout, stress, fatigue. Um, we couldn't actually do our jobs. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it ended up being sort of, we're just doing everything we can to survive. 
What strategies have you found helpful to cope with unhealthy work environments? <laughs> when, I, when I started to write these down, it was sort of an off the cuff. I started to kind of laugh, but and I sort of thought, well, I just am being like, you know, kind of off the cuff and sarcastic, but I actually think these are, are actually, these are actually the strategies I use, um, which kind of says something. Like saving enough money to quit or take extended leaves of absence, um, getting healthcare professionals in my court so I can qualify for continued health insurance under the family medical leave absence or temporary perm permanent disability when I do leave, um, structuring my life simply enough that if I need to quit, I can get government benefits, structuring my income so I can earn just enough to afford rent and still qualify for food stamps, heating oil, and Medicaid. Uh, researching ways to house myself if I end up homeless. Self-employment um, to get to um, to get myself maximum freedom and independence. I think there's there's a lot of people who are in work situations that are not working for their brains. How did you come to start your business? I worked in a corporate traditional architecture practice setting for almost 20 years, I, I um, started working, I went to architecture school, night school for architecture. So successful, but my own measure, I felt like I wasn't actually doing anything. And I had a really tough time sitting at a desk. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, so I, I, I looked for opportunities to basically get out of the office when well, I bought a house and I'd started to um, do work on it. So I go into the office in the morning and then uh, say, I, well, I got to go, you know, I, I can only put in a half day today and I'd leave and I had all my equipment set up and I'd climb out the bedroom window and put shingles up on the side of the house. And that was like super, um, uh, I, I, it was just so fulfilling to me. Uh, I basically started the construction business. Um, and the reason for that was people would drive by the house when I was working on it and they'd stop and they'd be like, I need somebody to ring shingle my house. And, and so that's how I got into doing construction. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm completely self-taught when it comes to like, you know, estimating and that whole side of um, I'm, I'm trained as, as an architect. So the design part of it is, um, is, uh, very manageable, but, um, uh, and, and the practice has been through some ups and downs. I Changing careers. I mean, literally as my, I, I like in my thirties, my mental capacity to really do the grind of law started to, to massively decrease. And I just couldn't cognitively sustain 60 or 80 hour weeks where of being mentally on. And so I, I switched to sort of a mental health and then um, eventually more peer support, which, which drew a lot more on experiential and empathic capacities. And I didn't have to be, I didn't have to use my problem solving abilities like, you know, 16 hours a day. And that was much, and that, and that's been a much better path for me. There's a, there's a, a lot of pressure in a, kind of business, you know, environment, small business, whatever, um, to move things along, get to the point, you know, set the table and let your, my team delegate. So, so that's where it, it sometimes it gets in the way of not that I'm, I don't think that I'm, I'm have learned to be pretty good about delegating, but uh, sometimes it just takes me a long time to get there. So uh, I made the decision to myself that I needed a business partner that could sort of ground the business in the things that I didn't have uh, or that I, I couldn't bring to the table. Uh, kind of worked through to figure out like what I need to prioritize in a job in the hiring process is I, if I can, uh, if I can avoid it, I won't take jobs where I can't wear headphones. Um, and because for me, music is my like number one self-regulation technique. 
um, and it helps to block out the sound of air vents and convection ovens, which is super overwhelming to me. Um, so one of the questions that I always ask on like an interview or a training day is like, okay, how many other people are going to be in the kitchen with me? Um, will I need to be super alert to people like passing through the kitchen? Can I bring headphones or earbuds in with me? I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't love it. Um, a lot of people get siloed into food service as like a tool of marginalization of like, we're going to shove you back here and underpay you where no one can see you um, for 20 years. But, um, you know, it's it's cool that I get to like go to work every day and I know that what I'm what I'm doing, like what I do yeah. is feed people. I make food for people to eat that makes them full or makes them happy um, or makes them frustrated and gives them something to complain about to the other people that they got breakfast with. Um, but like, I know that the job that I'm doing is necessary <laughs> for like human beings and that it often adds extra joy to people's lives. And I know that when I leave the building, my work is done. I'm not worried about like, I missed something. I'm not worried about like, is this take home work going to take me like the amount of time that I thought it would. I like my time once I leave the building is mine. Um, what do you wish other employers knew about creating healthy workplace culture? Exactly. And so the pandemic actually was helpful in the sense for us that we reevaluated like, wait, is this working for us? And we're able to reflect on some observations again and say, actually, that's not working for us. And really be like, wait a sec, what are we doing and why? And then can that change based on what we want to be doing? Um, and one of the things we wanted to be doing was less of a revolving door, more retention um, in our staff, because we know that consistency of care will also provide a better foundation for the children if it's this, these same teachers um, and those same colleagues working together. And we know people want to be here. And so the question is, what do you need to be here? Like, what, what is it that you need in order to be doing this job that you love or that you want to be doing? So before we connected with Mel and All Brains Belong, before even knowing about the term access needs, we were sort of asking folks what their access needs were to be able to show up and feel good about the work that they were doing. Because people were kind of showing up, but it wasn't feeling good, you know. Um, and so to feel good in your work um, and to show up was really important. And it just was a lot of a lot of conversation, individual conversations, conversations as a whole as a whole staff to determine sort of what we needed um, and really making space for those voices to be heard. And so it wasn't that Vicki and I were saying, this is what people need, you know, as sort of part of the leadership team. It was really asking those people to tell us because we can make tons of assumptions, but um, a lot of those tend to be inaccurate. And so that was a really, I just want to emphasize yeah. how important that piece was um, for, for us in the process. Well, and we learned that particular to the pandemic, we learned that a lot of people didn't have a primary care doctor or didn't have health insurance, including some of the admin team. And so we um, became, in a sense, especially Cecilia, like resource coordinators, and we would have on the clock, you know, during the work week, we have, we still do this. Mm -hmm. We have time with people who need, because you're working Monday through Friday, but that's when everything's open and you have to make your phone calls. And, um, so we, we, we have time for people to connect with one of us, mm -hmm. usually Cecilia, to like call Vermont Health Connect and figure out health insurance or to call the health advocates or to call and how to emergency housing, find a therapist, find a therapist. Um, mm -hmm. food, access to food. Yeah. So those kinds of things mm -hmm. we just had to learn more about people's individual struggles and individual situations and also then the collective needs of like, what are the barriers to doing the work that we want to do? And we really want to go against the rhetoric that like everything should be done in isolation by yourself. And so that's also a way that we open that up to say, let's do this together because, you know, health insurance, for example, doesn't make sense to a lot of us. So if we can work together and support each other, that feels better for everyone. Um, so I use this uh, like a to do list app kind of thing, like just they're not 
task reminders. They're reminders to me, either my brain or my business owner. And, and one of the things is, you know, this pops up every morning at uh, when I'm starting work. It uh, is good leaders offer opportunity for growth, but as importantly, they also understand unique needs of the people they are leading. So, you know, for me, that's like, um, that's what I had to, when I recognized that, it was because I recognized like that was my own situation, you know? So it makes sense that like, if I can expect myself to be kind of, you know, neurotypical, then there's a likelihood that all my staff is not, like nobody's neurotypical, right? You know, so um, there is no such thing as that. Absolutely agree. It's just the the like the the assumptions or the cultural beliefs that people grow up with. Like you're a little kid, and you're basically taught there is one correct default way to be a person, and it's nonsense. Mm. We have a lot of trade partners, subcontractors, uh, material suppliers, and stuff like that, and it, it is so we are so dependent, you know, um, and um, and we we try to have um, we try to have a framework of expectation for certain things because you know it can't be just a total free for all, but at the same time, like there's like our 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 plaster that does almost all the board and plaster on our jobs. Um, he's a single dad. He uh, he manages uh, you know the all the the business financial end of his business. Um, he's got a couple of staff. Um, he also stocks like the job sites every his job sites every morning. You know, so. Um, so we know, I know just over the years that uh, we're not likely to get a quote, but we've talked and we know enough um, uh, that we know what his pricing is. So, you know, we make, we, we make some uh, accommodations there and then, you know, he's gonna send me a message on usually, you know, maybe Thursday, um, uh can i can i get a check you know and uh it's, that's hmm. really tricky and what i'm hearing from you is this awareness of like the whole of a person you know so you mentioned you know this person's a single dad and they're doing this and they're doing that and they're doing you're even thinking about them as the character in their own movie of their own business which i mean that's the way that my brain told you took your story and translated it and i'm picturing the you know the guy and he's doing all the things and he's delivering this anyway he's got the kids anyway like you're seeing that and think about it. so many people are not giving a character like that the right time of day mm. yeah for sure um i i think um and the the challenge <laughs> it hasn't been easy to stay in business because <laughs> um because um because it takes time that's not necessarily um and and that that kind of investment um is not what our system is set up to reward by uh, you know um making uh making enough money to keep the doors open um but great right. especially when you've got you know so so you, as you've described you need a team an interdependent team to run the business and then when you're responsible for the livelihoods of other people, I mean, it's, a, I feel it too. It's just a lot of mm, pressure. It is a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cause, cause you do feel responsible for, uh, your, your team and your trade partners and your vendors and their families and, uh, their communities. And, you know, it's, um, uh, yeah, uh, you, that, that, that interdependence is, um, it's all about community. What do you wish other employers knew about creating a healthy workplace culture? Um, that it's not enough to fix problems as they come up. You have to think about the people who are working for you, the people who might work for you, the things you might not know about the people who are working for you and whether or not there is already space for them to work comfortably and healthily in that environment. Um, and I think that like, 
that is something that's like really under considered and that like a lot of the time that leaves room for people to um create ableist and classist practices um and couch them in language of non-discrimination um and that if you really think about like okay could this kind of person who experiences these kinds of marginalization walk in here and feel like they could commit to this job um like would they be able to do it would they be able to account for their safety and their health would they feel comfortable knowing that they would not be fired for being trans or for being a person of color and have it like couched in some other terminology like what can i do to make sure that this place is not only safe but like has space built in for people who are not like the normative cishet white man model that we built the 40 hour work week around um and that like if you aren't seeing a group or several groups of people represented in your workplace that is because you made it a space that they could not show up to you either like are advertising for employment in the wrong channels you are not offering enough money you are letting your employees say microaggressive ignorant stuff that they don't know about you are expecting your employees to be able to do things with their bodies um that they don't necessarily have to do i really think we need to reimagine work i mean i just i i i uh, i think it's bigger than just um i mean i think certainly think that there's ways that employers can be sensitive to a variety of stressors and sort of you know do this universal design thing but it still doesn't get away from the power imbalance. So like having employers who are like, kind of like preemptively thinking about like, how are my employees, how are my coworkers moving around this space? And like having coworkers who were like, okay, I've got a little bit of positional power here. How can I use this to make my coworkers lives better when I know it would be heard better coming from me. And that's something that like having had people do that for me is like really important to me is like if I see a coworker at my job being treated unfairly or to like see something in like the kitchen get like that tends to like get them bent out of shape knowing that like as a man oftentimes people are more willing to listen to me than like my femme and woman counterparts being able to be like hey I've noticed that like we could really fix that problem eh <laughs> like a lot of people work in areas that tend toward exploitation and dehumanization um and some of those folks are like i'm just doing this until like i make it in a creative field i'm just doing this until i am finished with this certification that's going to let me do this job that i really care about and some people are like i've been forced to do this because of racism because of classism and discrimination in hiring practices so on and so forth and some of us are there because we want to be and because we think that it's important that people do those jobs and that whether you are working a job that tends towards exploitation and dehumanization or you in your day-to-day -day life are profiting from other people working those jobs whether it's buying your coffee at a coffee shop that a barista makes or like going to the grocery store where someone is stocking the shelves um those are jobs that like are inherently like full of dignity like that work matters on a fundamental level and is important and is noble and like even if you want to do it being treated poorly doing those kinds of jobs can really weigh on you and like it's important that you're doing that work whether you continue to do it or not it's you should be proud of it do you have any advice for other employers that might be wanting to be more aware of this kind of thing prioritize humans that, and not profit yeah <laughs> that's exactly right it's about respect for humans i mean to make it's not it's not easy but it's kind of simple um and you know you, you can't have a healthy workplace environment where we're spending all of these waking hours 
if you're not thinking about those workers who are there um, and really recognizing that humans deserve to feel belonging and deserve to feel a place where they're part of something. And in fact, we thrive off of that sort of social collaboration. And um, I think for a long time, a lot of us have been socialized, like I was saying before, to sort of silo, isolate, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, and that's something we really want to break down and try to rebuild in a different way where we're utilizing one another um, as supports. And this is all really important for us to be transparent about because we're teaching the children. They're, they're watching our every move. Um, and it's important to us at Turtle Island that children are um, going into the world, you know, with ideas about respect and kindness for humans and understanding that other human has a, a, a place and has feelings and emotions, you know, and perspective. Um, and if we're asking kids to do that, then we better be doing it ourselves. So there we have it. I just want to put up one more slide just to thank our panelists. Go. So we are so grateful to Sarah Knutson, Nathaniel May, Cecilia Puleo, Theo Rodas, and Vicky Senny for sharing, sharing their experiences with us. Um, and I think what, what, what we heard from so many people in the chat all along was that there were so many things that resonated with so many people here. And um, I would love to um to hear any other um any any what's what's standing out for for any of you who would like to share and that guy back to the all workplaces are different but then when a neurotypical like someone in our level of capacity goes in there, it's going to be a challenge for us. How do we fit into that environment? How do we fit into within the colleagues, you know, the, the colleagues that might be there? <laughs> MBA learning curve, I guess. Yeah, and I think that it is really um, when when someone is in a situation where um, the environment is the people in it like don't get it. Um, there is um, it's you can't make people do the work, and I think that it's 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 like you know, neurodivergence is like, it's only, it's, 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 if we're at a place where, I mean, and, 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 and I would, I would say that, you know, when, like, when we do trainings for employers, we're not like, here's how you're inclusive of the autistic people or the ADHDers. Like, we're just like, this is how you structure neuroinclusive environments. This is how you build environments for people with all types of brains to thrive. Um, it's not about like doing something special. It's 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 about doing everything you do in you know in multiple different ways. You know, you teach people about universal design um, because I think you know first off, um, not not all employ not all neurodivergent employees are going to feel safe. That they're not going to be safe disclosing. Um, uh, at work, like that's that's one piece. Two is they may not actually know, um, you know, uh, right? So so and so 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 to be able to say like, well, we do it this way. This is the default, but like, we're we're happy to do something special on the side. Like that's not that's not gonna be anyway. And 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 I think that um uh, and and I, I I said this in 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 this this video we just watched about like think about how many people are quitting their jobs and how many people like just just like the turnover and you know have employers who are having a hard time filling positions and keeping people in positions like turns out like 
really this benefits everybody universal design benefits everybody Well, for, even for someone like me, my level of capacity, I actually work within the, um, I actually open up the Zoom groups for alternative to suicide here in Australia. And I never thought at some of my level of capacity could even, it, it's an online thing, but then really some one of, our, one of my colleagues had to go away overseas. And I actually got, they let me in to open up the room and everything and sit with people who share their stories. And I never thought I could even say the word colleagues in my life because I've never really medically worked. Because I just had my birthday on the weekend and like, even though for my age of turning 49, I thought I'd never ever say that word colleagues. But now I can because these these people that they're down in New South Wales and stuff, they accept from they accept me for me, where some other organisations still see this as a some form of um, defect, or I'm you know, not up to speed or something, and I'm like, well, yeah, you know, and I'm only starting to work that out. I'm like, what the hell? This is me. This is what you get. Yes, I may be brain damaged and more on autistic, rah, 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 rah. Well, and hearing impaired, but hey, this is me. This is what you get. Why can't we all accept each other for who they are and so we can get along with, along within, within, within the community and society no matter where we live? I can't think of a more perfect way to wrap up this brain club. Thank you, Tanya, um, because really that's what this is about. This is about, I mean, you, you're, you're describing, you feel like you belong. These people make you feel like you belong. Isn't that the point? Oh, so, hell yeah. Yes, it does. It, it took so long for, for me to get there. And there, there is still hope for people, even though they feel down and, you know, I've got the nothing's happening for them. But hey, I keep, I keep chipping away. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what, you know, you just keep chipping away. You just never know something might be around the corner. Right. And, um, you know, surrounding yourself with people who get it, where you do feel safe, where you do feel like you belong. Because if you've never felt safe in a group, you don't know it's possible. So you go into yet another toxic environment and you're like, oh yeah, that's how I feel like around groups. It's like, no, that's how you feel in groups that are not inclusive, right? So, so you, you have, like you, 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 you don't know what safe feels and if you've never felt it before. And then like the idea is that, you know, yeah, it's chipping away, but it's like more than that. It's more like you, you have to be able to discern safe from not safe because you have to have something to compare it to. So anyway, all, 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 all part of reimagining community. Thank you all so much. And I hope you'll join us next week. Um, and as I said earlier, we're going to be joined by guest presenter, Chrissy Colon Bratt, who's a co-author, uh, um, uh, a Vermonter, who's a co-author of the book, Parenting for Social Justice. I want to say good morning and good day because it's 9 a.m. here in Australia. So you all have a lovely evening over in your neck of the woods too. And a good so, night too. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye.